on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program from uh, the New Republic, Jonathan Cohn. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, the the piece uh, in the New Republic, I think this uh, current issue of the New Republic, uh, is entitled "The Hell of American Daycare." It's a um, it's it's. It's a, it's a great piece. It's a it's a pretty emotional read. In in in, in addition to being um, uh, really informational about an issue that for for some reason it seems to get has had traditionally very little uh, attention paid to it in this country. But let's let's first just start uh, uh, with the issue uh, in and of itself. Um, you have found, and I know you've done uh, stories in the past about the importance of the of the develop uh, of, of children's development in the first couple of years of their life. Talk about that a little bit, uh, because it really is the predicate to why our failure to provide daycare in this country is uh, so problematic. Sure, um, you know we. I mean, I think you know it doesn't take a genius to to recognize that the first. Uh, you know, early in life, first few experiences are going to be important. But in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, scientists, and uh, I use that term broadly to include, you know, neuro, you know, neuro researchers, psychologists, uh, biologists, doctors, um, have really been able to pinpoint uh, the way that what you experience very early in life, particularly your first two years, your first three years, um, that has an incredibly powerful effect on how you will act and behave later in life, um, down to the level of, you know, where experiences, what you experience in those first few years actually changes the architecture of your brain. Um, and so we know for a fact that, you know, if you grow up in a sort of nurturing environment, in a supportive environment, and you have lots of good, positive give and take interactions with an adult as a baby, um, you're going to kind of, your brain's going to develop in a way that you'll be, you know, you're much more likely to not just to be smarter, but to have kind of, you know, the ability to focus, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you, the, the sort of what they, what, what a lot of people call the soft skills that allow you to su succeed in life, whether it's in business or school or whatever, any activity. The flip side, if you're not in that kind of environment, you're not getting that kind of stimulation, you're not getting the interaction, or worse still, you're actually experiencing uh, some kind of negligence or abuse, you're not going to develop those skills. And these are the kids that are much more likely to grow up when they get older. Um, they end up in trouble in school. They end up in trouble with the law. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's horrible for these kids. It's bad for society, obviously. And, and, and even if you just want to be, think about the numbers here, the dollars, it's bad for us because, you know, it's a lot cheaper spend that money up front on making sure these kids are in a good preschool and a good uh, environment than it is to spend the money 20 years later, you know, on special education and, you know, on juvenile detention and uh, unemployment and extra, you know, uh, health care, because a lot of these people end up with health problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and a lot of this really has to do in, in many respects. I mean, we say, you know, sort of a, a nurturing environment. We're also talking about this is something that really impacts, I mean, the, the, it, it impacts low-income uh, people sort of in two ways. One, that if you're in uh, maybe middle or upper-middle income, you have a lot more opportunity, obviously, because you have, you have cash to send your kids to daycare. Uh, if, you, uh, if you are lower income, you don't have as much opportunity to do so. And we also know, I mean, this statistic um, I found uh, some time back, um, I think it was uh, when I was doing uh, the up for a couple of days. Ki children of low-income uh, families e enter into kindergarten with a listening vocabulary of 17,000 fewer words than that of a child of middle income. I mean, so the, the deficit that kids, lower-income kids uh, deal with starts right out of the gate, and it's impossible to make, it, to make that up. Yeah, it's a real double whammy for just just as you put it. I mean, you know, if you're if you if you're if you're in a low income family, uh, strike one is you can't find. You know, it's a lot harder to find a good uh, daycare or preschool for your child uh, because you can't afford it. And then the second whammy is that now that you've been penalized 
because you can't get, you know, you, that, that's the penalty. As a result, when your kids grow up, you know, now they're, they're, they're now worse off. I mean, just, and, and it happens right away. Like you said, they enter kindergarten, and they just they haven't heard as many spoken words. And, you know, everything we know about how uh, kids develop language skills, how to read, how to write, how to speak, you know, that's all about the give and take with adults about speaking and hearing. And, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's tragic. And okay, so uh, so what is the state of uh, of uh, daycare in this country? I mean, how many how many people get it? Um, and to the extent that they do get it, uh, how do they get it? And uh, you, I mean, your your story focuses around the sort of the uh, one aspect also of the story is is just how loosely regulated daycare is in in different states. I guess it depends on where you are. There's no national standard here. That's right, and and you know, and the preface to this, I should say, is that it is it was shocking to me that how little information we have uh, about daycare in the United States, even at the level of how many kids are in daycare. I mean, we go the numbers I use are the census numbers, but if you talk to the people at the Census Bureau, they'll tell you they're not the most perfect numbers because they they're like based on questions in a survey, and it's and it's the categories are a little blurry. So it's not even just to make a blank statement. This is how many children are in daycare. It's actually a very difficult statement to make. But you know, roughly speaking, there's several million children uh, every day who are, uh, and it's somewhere between you know a third and a half or maybe more who are in the care of someone other than their parents. And again, it, it depends on, you know, some of them are just some days a week, some are every day a week, but it's a very large number of children. And, it's, and, and, you know, and it's a reflection of the fact that unlike 100, 150 years ago, uh, the majority of uh, kids now have uh, uh, their mother's work. Uh, women are now in the workforce. I think that's a, you know, that's a good thing. I'm, you know, this is, this is, this is a very, you know, this was a, I think a sign of our progress. But, you know, we haven't yet sort of come to terms with the fact that, okay, well, if we're not you know, if kids aren't all going to, you know, majority of them aren't going to be taken care of at home by a relative, well, who is going to take care of them? And, and that's where we get into the question, well, what kind of daycare is out there? And the best information we have is it's not very good overall. Um, there are some great daycares out there, some small percentage, but the majority of them are mediocre at best, and then there's a small minority that are really horrible. And they're horrible both in the sense they don't provide the kids with what they need, and they're horrible in the sense they can actually be hazardous. Uh, kids are in unsafe environments. And uh, this is, again, you know, this is not something we would tolerate in our public schools. Uh, even though, you know, lots of public schools have problems, I mean, we would not tolerate this level of quality in our public schools. But for some reason, we do frequently when it comes to daycare. Well, this is, I mean, this is really the one of the big t- takeaways of, of your piece is that, uh, and it and it and it sort of bleeds through in in these different fashions that there is very little data on it that there has been um, I guess over the years a couple of you you cite a couple of times where there's been attempts to um, uh, increase uh, daycare uh, but that it's not not really a national issue now now in the 1960s we started uh, uh, Head Start I guess it was and you also mentioned two programs uh, Georgia and Oklahoma which were I think. The Georgia was cited by President Obama, I believe it was in the State of the Union, uh, when he, he spoke about uh, universal uh, pre-K. But just tell us about the plans that are in existence now and their pluses and minuses. Sure. So we do have Head Start, um, which started in the 60s. And, uh, you know, Head Start was... It, it, you know, it's important to think of, you know, what, when we say daycare, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a, a, a program that's basically for working parents so that their kids are in a safe, nurturing place where they get some, you know, good stimulation or whatever? Um, Head Start is not that exactly. Head Start is something different. Head Start is basically a very targeted effort uh, to help very low-income kids from, 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 from backgrounds that put them at risk of failure later in life and give those kids the skills they need. Um, now, there's a whole separate controversy, and we we'll need to get into right now, about whether Head Start really lives up to that potential or not as a program. But, you know, apart from that, you know, Head Start exists. Um, it is, you know, in general, you know, as day, you know, in terms of fulfilling the function of a daycare, it's pretty good. The problem is it's pretty small. I mean, it vastly serves a, a, a fraction of the kids who would be eligible to be in that program. Um, we do, the government does provide money uh, to assist uh, uh, some people with, uh, paying for daycare. There's something called the uh, child, it, it's a very, it's a, it's a mouthful, but it's basically the uh, child development and uh, block grant. 
And uh, that is basically money that goes to the states. So the states can provide vouchers to, 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 to people who need help paying for daycare. And, and that's a very good program. The problem is the vouchers aren't that big, and there aren't that many of them. So most states, you have waiting lists for assistance with daycare. Um, there are tax credits. The tax code, you know, if you have kids, you can, you can take some money off your taxes, and there's an extra one. Uh, you know, again, that sort of, so a lot of these are targeted more to low-income families. But the, the bottom line is that we provide some assistance. We provide some, some care directly through Head Start, but it's not nearly enough to meet the need that we have, uh, which is much greater than the need that existed when these programs came into existence. Now, what's happening in, uh, in these sort of pilot programs in, in Georgia and Oklahoma? So in Georgia and Oklahoma, on their own, uh, both decided to start uh, what they call universal pre-K programs. Basically saying, you know, they, they basically programs, or preschool programs, uh, where basically the government says, we will help you pay for preschool if you can't afford it on your own. And, and these programs seem to be doing pretty well. They're popular. Uh, researchers have been looking at the effects of them and have found that kids who go through them uh, end up better off. Um, you know, but, you know, it, they're, they, they cost a fair amount of money. Uh, in a lot of other states, you know, we're waiting for, you know, most states don't do that. Now, uh, Well, what do you make of the fact that oh, it's these two states that are doing it? I mean, it, it seems to me these, they wouldn't be the first states that I guess would be doing it. You know what I mean? It, it, yeah, it, yeah, no, that's right, that's right. I mean, you mean that because they're more conservative states yeah, and more they're more states? conservative. It's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, big government program, I guess. Um, but what, what are we to make of the fact that these states are doing it and that it is popular, both in terms of the opportunity it presents uh, for a national uh, type of program or, you know, however it's, it's administered, and the fact that this, these are programs that are taking place in red states? Yeah, no, I actually think this is one of the things that make me most optimistic about the future. Um, you know, the fact that you did have Georgia do this, you did have Oklahoma do this. Um, you know, the idea of doing something to help kids, young kids, I mean, I, I, I do believe that's something that has a lot of appeal, uh, regardless of ideology, regardless of political orientation. And I think that the evidence that we have on these programs is strong enough that you don't have, you can be a conservative, and you can look at these and say, you know what, I may not like government, I may not like to spend money, but this is one of those investments that just makes sense to me. I can see the numbers add up. I want to do something good for kids, and that's why these programs have been able to come, you know, survive, you know, to pass and to survive and to thrive uh, in states that, you know, in conservative states that are very, you know, not the places you would expect. And I think going forward, that's just there is an openness, there's, there's, there's at least an open mind about this and maybe a constituency for doing something meaningful on early childhood that gets out of the sort of just, it's not going to be just liberals, it's not going to just be the New England states. Um, there is a broad constituency for there. Um, and, and uh, you know, maybe something can happen over time. It does take money to do this right. Um, if you think about what the problems are with child care and you look at what it takes to fix the problems, at the end of the day, you're always having to find some money, and obviously in this political environment, money is hard to come by, and in general, conservatives are less excited about it, but it can be done. And I think, uh, you know, there's, there's hope that I think over the next few years, maybe something will get done.